HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Hey guys, this is Gabby Douglas. If you have an active lifestyle like me, hydration is key. That's why I love the Hydration Watermelon Smoothie from Smoothie King. Blended with whole fruits, coconut water, and more electrolytes than some of the leading sports drinks, Hydration Watermelon is the cleaner way to hydrate with no artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives. So you can recover and perform at your peak ability during the summer heat. Order online or through the app for pickup or delivery. Smoothie King, rule the day. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. My guest today is Josh Davidson. Since founding his company in 2009 at the age of 16, Josh has been on a mission with his team at ChopDog.com to make a difference and impact as many entrepreneurs as possible. Josh and his team help clients turn their brilliant ideas into beautiful applications and powerful brands. He is also the author of the new book, The Entrepreneur's Framework, How Businesses Are Adapting in the New Economy. Thanks so much for joining me today, Josh. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, I have a sort of <laughs> interesting question for you, and I certainly hope you take it the right way. Um, <laughs> I am wondering, <laughs> just to set you up for this, um, I'm wondering if you can tell the listeners when it was that you realized you were a terrible leader. I would say, well... I realized I was a terrible leader in by 2012 when I was ba- basically self-sabotaging our operations. Though the epiphany, you would say, where it went from, am I being a terrible leader to, God damn, I suck, was probably 2013, <laughs> to be precise, where when it was rock bottom. Um, so, yeah, it's um, for, the, for the listener at home having no idea. I actually had a second company, almost shut down Chop Dog to work on it. Um, Spent basically a year working on my team, working in the deaf, and 
we ended up running out of money, having nothing to show for it. And literally, yeah, and just kind of ceased at that point because we had no money left, no momentum left, no traction or anything. So, okay. But so you're saying that you, the, like the, it started in 2012, but you really came to the realization in 2013. Was it because that was when you had to shut the doors that then you had to really face, sort of, you know, do a... Yes, um, I mean, I, I definitely... Was a terrible, on it? In hindsight, I was a terrible leader since 2009. It's just my mistakes and lack of leadership ability and a lack of a lot of things in entrepreneurship ability really didn't come to a head till 2012, right? During the peak of it. And it wasn't until facing those obstacles in 2012 and then bottoming out in 2013 where I had to face the reality of like, okay, something's clearly wrong and I'm pretty sure I know what it is, right? And leadership's one aspect, is a major aspect of it, but just one of the, 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 the principles that basically made me a screw up, a failure, right? At that time. And, I'm, and honestly, I'm grateful for it. I think that failure is the best achievement I've ever had in my career because without it, I would have not become the individual I am today or running the company that I do today. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful because it reminds people that I, most of the lessons that we learn are really through our failures, not our successes. Definitely. Um, I, I, I actually, if a lot of times I do talks at like universities and schools and conferences, you know how they always have just fireside QA chats after they always ask like, what do you think is your biggest success of your career? And usually I'll use my failure and subtle. And most people give me like 20 eyes, like what the hell? How is that a failure of your biggest success? But like most people, that type of failure, that's it, right? That they fold the cards and they don't stare at the abyss and decide they're going to do something about it. So I, I wear like a badge of honor. It's why in the book it's like in the, the, the forefront, because I think nothing more distinctly paints the picture of an entrepreneur than basically realizing as an entrepreneur, you might be good at just one or two things and suck at everything else and understanding how can you take your strengths and mitigate your weaknesses and then leverage that to be an asset. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Okay. So I heard you say that you were working on, you know, that, that you put um, chop dog on, sort of on the back burner that you were working people to death, but what was it that, or what were the things that you were doing or not doing that made you a bad leader? So I actually, so what I did is, in a, how can I basically articulate this? There's eight things that I believe an entrepreneur has, right? So it, it comes to like your ability to be self-aware, how you're deploying empathy, leadership's a major component of it. You're thinking both short-term and long-term, economic side of things, operations and purpose. And the reality is I wasn't giving any of them their just desserts, just to put it right. Like the only thing focusing on was, hey, at the time I had $50,000. This is the money. You guys are going to work your asses off, pardon my French. And we're going to hit this arbitrary deadline that I set here with no rhyme or reason by August 1st. And a lot of things went wrong with that, right? Like number one is money's not a main motivator to people, right? Like it's a big contributing factor, yeah. but you put them into a like hackathon environment for almost a year. And it's not going to be a contributing factor plus who's spending their money anyway when they're always working, right? Like that's number one. Two is there was no rhyme or reason. We had no methodology. Like today as an entrepreneur, my company runs on methodologies and processes. In fact, we're like a well-oiled machine because of that. We know how to do, go to step two. You need to finish step one and why step one is important. We had no rhyme or reasoning then. So basically like designers will be designing stuff while programmers are programming stuff. Designers will change something that made all the programming obsolete. Programming would do something that would impact design. So design had to go back. It's like all this back and forth and keeping up with the Joneses mindset. And on top of it, leadership top down, that's where the buck stops, right? Like I was fueled by ego, by greed. I had no direction, you know, it was all the recipe for disaster. And you can do the math in August, you have nothing to show for yourself when that's when you wanted to launch and you're out of money, you're out of time, you don't have anything to show for it. And your team basically hates your guts because you overworked them and they trust you as the leadership as in your case, the entrepreneur, the leads have an understanding of like where the direction is going, how everything's going to make sense. And when they realize everything you're doing has no rhyme or reason, nothing makes sense. 
and you're clearly blinded by like lust, right? Like that's the last way to describe it. You know, it's an easy to understand why I had a team that pretty much hated my guts on top of the fact that we put Chop Dog on hiatus or precursor to that. It was actually generating hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in revenue, right? Like, and basically shut down that revenue source of stability and understanding where it was being successful in spite of me at the time, right? Like, but it was a, yeah. it's, it was like a, a kamikaze mission in essence, um, where it was just, it was set up for failure from the start. Okay, so that leads me to another question. I, because I think a lot of companies end up being successful in spite of the poor leadership mm -hmm. at the very top. But yep. do you think that that, that is, uh, that is not sustainable, that it's short-term success? So this might sound like a cop and answer, but it's the truth. I think market fit in product can supplement terrible leadership to an extent. Huh. I think you handicap your ceiling, but I think you can be successful and inspire yourself. It's so much more difficult and so much more stressful and aggravating, and you're not going to reach the ceiling you otherwise could reach. But market demand can sometimes fix problems that you don't realize are problems at the time, right? Right. Like if you're making yeah. money left and right, in spite of yourself, you might be not looking to identify problems that can make you more profitable, more functional, happier. But with that said, flip the script, I think good leadership, understanding leadership, deploying those principles can help you find market fit easier, can help you scale much easier. And I, I think with market fit can help you be that much larger. So uh, don't get me wrong. I think, bad leadership can automatically sabotage itself too. Like I'm talking yeah. more unicorn based or market fit can supplement even the works of leadership, you know, but with that said, it is possible to be against the rule. I think it's just statistically a lot harder. Okay. I, I tend to agree with you. I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. So um, do you believe, and I agree with you that great entrepreneurs outsource, but I think there are people listening who are thinking to themselves, no way, man, I, I am not going to do that because it makes me too vulnerable. How do I make sure that I'm outsourcing uh, to my, a my partner? Favorite convo. It's my absolute favorite. Right. So I like, I always use this argument right off the bat. I always say, sorry, apparently doorbell. Um, okay. I, I always, I always like to use this argument right off the bat, which is, Name me a big business that was all because of one individual. You can't. Now, some people might come with some cliche, like they'll say like the names you hear, like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs, but that's bullshit. They were one individual running those companies? Hell no. In fact, they're just doing one facet, right? Like the yeah. time where Chopped All grew, which was after Subtle, where we had such explosive growth, happened when I decided I'm working too much on my business and not in my business. Right. Or excuse me, working too much in my business and not all my business where I stepped away from focusing on day to day, working with clients, programming, designing and focus just on the bigger picture, just working on growing the company, the brand, the operations, the process. That's where that happened. Right. So I, I, I look at number one where it's like if you don't have a team, you're not an entrepreneur. You're really just a glorified freelancer. A freelancer is an individual. And outsource doesn't mean like you're outsourcing your team to like Uganda or Pakistan or China or Russia or India or something like that, right? Like outsourcing is like you bring on someone to help you with the day-to-day. -day. You bring on someone that's going to help you with sales. You bring on someone that's going to help you with customer service. And what you should do is think about what's your strengths? What are you really freaking good at? There's probably one or two things, right? Uh, okay. Like that's it? Yeah. You probably, I'm not going to say suck at everything else but you're probably average to below average everything else. Those are the areas you first focus on outsourcing, bringing people who know more than you with that stuff. And you'll see your output increases. So like, I'm actually pretty darn good at building a brand, business development, and sales. I'm great at that. I'm the first one to tell you, subtle Tommy, I suck at the day to day. I'm terrible. That's why I have a chief operating officer, right? Like why it was one of the first decisions I ever made was bringing someone on to focuses and obsesses with operations and is freaking good at it. Because he can sit down and understand how's our, our output, who's working on the right things at the right place at the right time. And then what I happened, I relieved that pressure from me to focus on that, to focus more on growing the company. And I had to support the infrastructure 
to handle that growth because we have someone obsessing over the day-to-day, -day, the minutia, the little details, right? And that's just one example. So to me, it's one of those things where like, you don't have to replace your strengths. And that's usually where you're most paranoid, where the most startup entrepreneurs are like, I can't, I don't want someone to handle sales. That's mine. Like they're going to mess it up. Okay. That's justifiable if you're good at it. What do you stink at or not enjoy? That's where you should outsource. That's where you should put that volume. You know, that's always been my logic. I think that makes a lot of sense. Is there um, a way for them to figure out who they should be partnering with? Yes. So two, it's actually, it's not an easy black and white answer. One, number one is there is a reasonable rationale where someone's like, I don't have the money to bring someone on. Like an early stage startup, you might have to be that master of none early on. You have to wear a hat. I think, but yeah. it's when people have enough capital where one or two things happens. They become, and I'm being blown up, it's selfish, where I put my ass into this. I deserve some money. And they don't hire out what could have helped them actually 10 extra revenue, 10 extra profitability. Ah. Because they're self-sabotaging themselves without realizing because they feel, I put in the work, it's time to reap the rewards. When in reality, you still have a long way to go before you can really do that and do it at such a scale that's unbelievable. And then the second thing that happens is self-awareness is such an underrated aspect of entrepreneurship. Most entrepreneurs, if I say, what do you stink at? And most of them are like, I don't stink at anything. I run my business good. No, everyone knows what their vulnerabilities are. Everyone knows what they don't enjoy. Right? Most aren't owning up to that. And the first thing you need to do is understand that so you can identify, okay, this is an area where if I put money here, I will give myself an extra X amount of hours back a week. And I can then grow the business by X because of that extra hours going in. And this area of the business can become stronger, which should save us X amount of money. You know, they don't think that way. And that's what you want to do. It's a math problem. That's how you should identify it. Using self-awareness as like the equation. Yeah, it's, uh, you're saying this and I I'm, and I'm keep thinking that so one of my favorite things is that short-term thinking has long-term consequences. And it feels like a lot of entrepreneurs practice short-term thinking, you know, mm -hmm. in the moment, mm -hmm. I can't afford it. And Instead you know what of, happens? And, and that it's fueled by emotion. Impact. And it's fueled yeah. by emotion. Yeah. It's, it's the, part of it, I, I, I emphasize it because I've been there. It's this survival yeah. instinct where you're like, I can't make a long-term decision because I might not have a long-term if I'm not focusing on a short-term. Right. And you right. have to train yourself like a muscle working out at the gym, get stronger, but not think that way, no matter how tough it is. And I get it. Like, as an entrepreneur, as the founders, the buck stops with you. You're, you're responsible for your clients, your customers, your team. You know, if you make the mistake, the one that's paying is everyone around you. It's not just you. It's, um, right. it's why entrepreneurship is really, it's, it's been glorified in the media and I'm the first one to say it shouldn't be because really only a select few have the natural talents to do it. Just being real yeah. because it's such a big responsibility. And I think people take it for granted with the illusion of you don't have to work a nine to five, which is also BS because the best entrepreneurs, <laughs> they're not working nine to five. They're working from when their eyes open until they, their eyes close at night. Right? Like that's how it works. So yeah. I'm not saying they work nonstop. I don't believe in hustle culture, but you know, even me, during Thanksgiving break, we're recording this right after Thanksgiving, right? I didn't yeah, actually do right. any meetings during Thanksgiving break. I'm spending time with my dad, my girlfriend, my, my family. And I'm still thinking back in my head about my business. At night when everyone's going to bed, I'm still answering a couple of emails. It's not hustle culture. I'm not burning myself out, but it's because it is your DNA, right? Like your business is like you had a baby and you're responsible for it, right? Like it's, yeah. that doesn't, that responsibility just is a nine to five type deal. Exactly. That's right. That's right. I agree with you. I, I, it worries me that we are in such a culture of entrepreneurship that everyone thinks they're supposed to be an entrepreneur when it really is not right for everybody. Everyone isn't cut out to be one. You know, the example I put in my book is in the 80s when rock stars really, really went mainstream, everyone was wanted to build a rock band because it looks so easy. All you need is a few musicians, yeah. a singer, and you can do it and rock stars are glamorized. Entrepreneurship is that. Entrepreneurship looks inherently yeah. easy. And here's actually a real example. I start off the book with this, so spoiler alerts, but I compare it to like being a basketball player where just because you can make a great free throw or a layup on the courts doesn't mean you're an NBA player, right? Yet someone who's right. good at sales or marketing 
or just operations automatically assume they're a great entrepreneur. When it's really, okay, you're great at a free throw or a layup. That's not enough to compete in the NBA. Right, right. That's a great analogy. Okay, here's sort of a, an odd question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I love um, odd questions. Talk, I know you do. That's why I'm going to ask it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about Benjamin Franklin and your, your view of him. He's the man. I, I, honestly, uh, <laughs> I, Walter Isaacson's bi, uh, auto, uh, autobiography, biography of Ben Franklin, is one of the most fascinating reads I've ever had. I probably read that book once a year. It's, um, to me, Ben Franklin was almost like the original modern day entrepreneur before modern day entrepreneurship, right? Like entrepreneurship really only became a thing in 1800s, early 1900s, like where you could finally build small communities because of railroads and stuff like that. And things we talk about in the book a little bit, right? But he was like the first individual that's like, went mainstream where it's like, I'm going to solve this problem. And half the time it was for himself. I always like use the bifocals example where he revolutionized glasses to the point where I wear glasses today that both have like that short term and far away lens tech where uh-huh. it's all in one lens. But was for Ben Franklin, that might not exist today. And he created for selfish reasons, the bifocals, because he hated reading up close and he didn't want to change his glasses every time he did it. So he created that, right? Um, but to me, I think he, he capitalizes a few things of the idea of like never settle for anything less, always question status quo and solve your own problems. And then nine times out of 10, when you solve your own problems, the problems other people have, you know, his home burns down. So what do you do? I'm going to figure out how can you capture lightning and protect it from burning down homes and things like that. Right? Like I need a resource to go and, and read. I'm going to create the library of Philadelphia because of the fact that I don't have this resource easily accessible to me, or I want to talk to creative people there's nothing that exists. I'm going to establish the Junto, right? So that a bunch of creative people will meet up weekly or things are, buildings are burning down off in Philly. How about we create a volunteer fire department to help solve this problem, right? So like the idea of taking that initiative um, and there's something about that spirit in that output. I think that's, if to me, this is kind of why I, I, I idolized him and actually referenced him in the book and even have a tattoo of Ben Franklin on me, kid you not, um, is the idea of like, he trained himself to look for opportunities constantly through solving his own problems. And it, it takes years, but I've learned the more I've done it myself where the more I'm just, I find a problem, the more I'm like, I wonder how I can solve this. And the more you ask yourself that and you figure out solutions, the more you keep doing that. Again, it's like going to the gym, you do a bicep curl every two, three days. Eventually you're going to do a lot of weight. It takes time. You build that tolerance. It's the same type of thinking there. And the craziest thing to me, why I, I look at him as a great example, this dude was not the smartest man on the face of the earth. He's a runaway as a kid, went to New York, then to Philly. You know, he wasn't really wanted. He, he perfectly average. Like, don't get me wrong, the way his thinking is above average, but his thinking wasn't, it was developed that way. Like, to the point where any of us can develop that same type of thinking pattern, the same type of behavior. So, um, yeah, I think I, I'm fascinated because I always feel like, if you put him in today's environment, what he could have accomplished now and what he was able to accomplish back then. And today's never been easier to solve problems and to build things. The right. internet and how the low cost of tech, the low cost of accessibility of technology has made it where it's almost unfair to compare to the 1700s versus the lack of infrastructure, the lack of tech, the lack of resources we now take for granted. So it only makes it that much more incredible what he accomplished. And I don't know, to me, it's like a great, it's a great reminder of building for more than yourself and using yourself to understand like, you're not like, how can I put it best way to describe at the end of the day, I'm just an average Joe. I know on a podcast, I might not seem that way, but it really is. But that's a good thing. If I'm an average Joe, there means there's probably hundreds and not thousands of people just like me that would probably want the yeah. same things that I want. And that's an area of opportunity, especially from an entrepreneurial context. Thank you for that. One of the things that I think is interesting about that is um, that Benjamin Franklin was a problem solver. And I think the best entrepreneurs are the ones who do seek to solve a problem as opposed to seek to make money. I think there's a real difference in mindset there. Exactly. No, so that's, 
I mean, and, and if you ever read his autobiography, I think it's even more fascinating. It's even beyond his product, uh, his like problem solving that's fascinating me. You know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is Ben Franklin was a, um, he wanted to find a mutual understanding between Great Britain and the colonies at the time. He did not want the United States of America to be independent and literally went to Great Britain as a last ditch effort to have civil conversations. Um, to try to keep that like so the, the man was also someone who understood the value in people understanding communication yeah. understanding of that having dialogue and hell it's easy to argue that those lessons still haven't been properly taught in today's world right and yeah, you know, right. the same issues he faced back then are happening today in many cases so um yeah there's a there's a lot to take away from when you look into ben franklin's life and what he accomplished Boy, no kidding. I, I did not realize. I'm glad I asked the question because I <laughs> did not realize a much better understanding now. I'll have to read uh, the autobiography. Um, we're going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Sure. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Built to Sell by John Warlow and The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients by David A. Fields. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Josh Davidson about how to become an empowering leader for your team. So um, I'm curious about if you would share with the listeners the importance of under-promising and over-delivering. Definitely. I mean, it's actually it's interesting, this question, because it almost, it, this is the one of the, I feel, this is like entrepreneurship 101 or business 101. Like, think about, this is what I put if I'm the listener. Think about the few times in your life where you're expecting something, you're provided so much more, what that experience did to you, how you felt, how many people you told about it how if it was a business you could continue to patronize them afterwards right because of how it's such a great experience to me it's if you can build a business based on that mentality which is hey if you have a client that gives you fifteen thousand dollars i'm going to give them twenty thousand dollars worth of service back without asking for the other 5k worth what that does in our case that's how i we have clients that have been with me for years because if you they pay you $100,000 for a service and you give them back $125,000 worth of value, they're going to keep coming back to you because they're going to feel like they're always getting their money's worth. They're going to know you take care of them. They're going to know that you genuinely care about them, right? It's, it's, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. It's almost like they're investing back into a customer, a client, a brand, a relationship. So to me, it's one of those things where when I get asked a question like this, I almost feel like saying, as an entrepreneur, if you're building a business, this should be a core component of your model to the point where it's not even a conversation to have under promise over deliver. It should just be ex an expectation. Like we're always going to give this much more. Like it's, it's like you're a coffee shop. Every time you order a medium coffee, you get a large pro bono. You're probably going to keep coming back to that shop and you're going to make so much more money and build it into your model. It's to me, it's just one of the easiest. I don't even call it a hack, but it almost feels like a life hack. And it works beyond business. Like if, if you have friends and family, don't hesitate to give 51% of that relationship and not expect anything back. You're going to be the one to always count on and trust on. Or it's like, even here, being on a podcast, if you're going to give your A game beyond what was expected, it's probably going to help you come back on a podcast, get more people to pay attention to you, to listen. So to me, it's almost like a baseline assumption that should be built in everything you do is DNA versus a talking point or something you're trying to do. Well, I agree with you, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on why more entrepreneurs don't think about it, realize it, put it into practice. I think we circle back to that um, short-term versus long-term thinking. In the short term, yeah. it's not as profitable, right? Or it's, 
extra work and who wants to actually put in extra work, right? Like that type of mindset. And they, I, if you put 20 entrepreneurs in a room and you ask how many of you are thinking beyond next year, right? Like one calendar year, 12 months for your business. How many do you think would raise their hands? One, maybe two people, right? It's yeah. that kind of thinking. Yeah. Versus yeah. If, I, if, if I tell you, I'm like, hey, I want you to plan your business in five-year intervals, just five years. What, how that shift in the mentality goes. If I say five years and you have a client on an eight-month contract, your shifting goes from just kicking butt on that contract to being, how do I turn that contract into 10 contracts, Right. Like it changes your whole perspective of reality in a way that puts everyone in their best interest. And the crazy part, it makes you more money because you're thinking on a bigger picture and you're investing in the bigger picture. It's, it's like you're investing in a mutual fund where you understand compound interest, getting dividends and your, your monthly contributions is going to keep adding up and growing. It's like a snowball going down a hill. That's kind of the way you look at it. That's really interesting. I never looked at it that way, but th that is, I love the example of if you have an eight month contract, then you're thinking, how do I turn this into 10? Because exactly. you're right. And you're it's, it's, longer, a, it's a you know? shift of mental wow. thinking. And the crazy thing yeah. is, so I've been on the other side and I emphasize of this, why I feel so strong that I can talk to is like, it's building that muscle. And when you start seeing it work, it only intoxicates you to do it more. And you got to trust it's going to work. And I often use the example, if you don't trust me or my business is not enough, look at the best businesses on the planet. I am guaranteeing you with every bone in my body, you will find the same DNA makeup at one point. Don't get me wrong. The leadership changes at the top, get greedy, like things like that happen. But look at their growth period, the high growth period. What was the DNA fundamentals that made that up? Every major fast growing company shares the same exact DNA makeup, every single one. Fascinating. Okay. So speaking of change and growth, if, if there is a, um, a change that needs to happen, like the company needs to go in a different direction, maybe the market changes, how does a, a business owner or a leader make sure that, that that's an inclusive process? So what do you mean by inclusive? I want to make sure I fully understand the question, like, like as fluid and natural as possible. Well, yeah. And, and that there's, um, uh, heightened buy-in, you know, that, that, that everyone is on board with the plan. You know what? It's, um, I can tell you how you get everyone to buy in, but it's easier said than done with the truth, which is, if you have a business built on the customer, what's best for the customer, it's easier to get people to buy in because if you're making a pivot that's natural, it's going to seem natural to what's best for that customer. So the only way uh, where it's more difficult to make that adjustment is if people are focusing on other factors in the customer, such as we're profit driven only or ego driven, or this is the way it's always has been driven. So it, it comes down, I think, first to the people makeup of your company, where not only you're bringing on the right people, but the right people that are focusing on the right things, which is a whole different element of it. And again, yeah. it comes to that crazy thing. You focus, like if you're a customer-driven company, which you should be, you don't exist without the customer. Odds are, not only will you make natural pivots always because you're doing what's better for the customer and learning, you're going to probably make more money out of it too because you're attracting that audience and understanding that audience, understanding their needs better, right? So- it's, I feel it's more natural. It's more difficult if you're not focused that way. So like when I pivoted back in 2011 to 2012 and from let's do websites to web apps at the time, it was a lot more friction because generally most of my team at that point just cared about their own stability and their own money in their pocket than they were caring about the customer, uh -huh. you know? And that was something that took me years later to realize versus now <clears throat> the reality is as a company, we make adjustments almost every month. We're always learning how to be better and we make small tweaks, which isn't big pivots at this point. We're always tinkering, right? But it's a natural process because everyone's obsessed with the same North Star. And that North Star in us is like 
How can we kick butt for our clients? How can we build the best apps on the planet possible and be their technical team that always has their backs, right? And when you have that mentality, making adjustments is aligned to that versus just aligned for growing the business, but they're actually are growing the business at the same time. Yeah, that's awesome. Huh, I totally get that. Speaking of that, how do you make sure you are bringing on the right people? Oh man, this, this, is, <coughs> this is such an open <laughs> question because, you know, I've learned this one. It depends on the industry and the business and what you're looking for. So there's no one answer here, right? Like, so listeners of podcasts run a small business like cafe might have a completely different answer than what I'm about to give, which is oh, cool. Yeah. It's like kind of my disclaimer, but for like for me, in my field, developers and designers, programmers and designers, right? Like when it comes to building apps and software, I, we're really good at knowing if you got or if you don't, meaning you know your stuff or you don't. It's, it's a very visual yeah. process. It's understanding. So when we go to hire, we automatically store people in two, pro, in two piles. Imagine it was old school having resumes on a desk, even though everything's digital now. One pile is, these people don't got it. Let's not talk to them. It's a waste of time. These are people that have the tangibles, the talent, the thing that you can't teach. So we'll talk to that one pile. At that point, all I'm asking is, we, we don't need to ask you anymore or how good of a designer are you or how good of a program are you yeah. or experience your school. Reality is we already know from a talent perspective and your cap and your capacity that you got it. We don't need to worry about that anymore. What we want to, we'll just talk to you now and drill down and find, figure out who's the best person here. Who's going to be the most communicative, the most open that we would want to go to bat with that can handle talking to our clients that clearly cares about more than just programming, but what they're building and why they're building and who they're building it for. That's what we're focusing most of the time and effort on. And like I said, that's, this works wonders for us. But the reality is, I know this might not be the same for a cafe or a cleaning service or a small business or a real estate. So it really does depend on your industry and your business model for that right answer. Well, true, except that I think the constant is that they have to culture be a cultural fit that they have to be a team player that they have to have the same feeling about the client like you were talking about before that if everyone is focused on that if everyone has the same north star that that you know plop into whatever your industry is whatever those skills are and they have to fit that same um direction and belief in order to be a meaningful member of the team. Definitely. So I don't disagree with that. I guess where I go into is there's different cultural makeups for different companies and industries. Yeah. Now, genuinely, yeah. it should be customer focused always, but there's different alignments to, here's a good example here is if you're a crisis PR company versus a, a different of an SEO company, you might have a different DNA makeup for your team roster. You might have someone that genuinely cares about the customer in a crisis PR environment, but if their laid back mentality is probably not going to work well in a crisis setting versus a stereotypical SEO company, right? So yeah. you also I have to understand that. like there is different cultural personality traits, which is, doesn't mean that person, like, the example I'm giving here is the wrong person or a bad person, but there's different aces in the holes depending on the context of the situation too. That's interesting. Okay. All right. I get that. Um, I think a lot of, or at least I see a lot of leaders micromanage and uh, not, and it is, is not a good thing. Um, can you talk some about that and, you know, talk about what it means to be a micromanager and how, because I think it's a control thing, but how someone can, Make sure they're still in control, but also allow people to flourish. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know anyone that actually enjoys micromanagers. So I always like to give an example. How the question, how can be a better boss, better leader is basically ask, how would you want to be treated? 
right? Like that's the distinct yeah. first question I ask. And empathy is just a good thing about this, right? Like understanding the person you're working with, what makes them thrive? So I have individuals on my team that are more driven by financial versus some that are more driven by what they're building versus some by knowing their part in the bigger machine, right? So you have to understand like that perspective of it. And you also have to understand a perspective like, I have some people on my team where they need that constant pressure to thrive versus others where constant pressure would make them break down, right? So you also have to understand like a great leader is someone that works through individual strengths and understands each individual and gets that aligned as a team. So it's, I think there's this common misconception right now of leadership where like one fits all for everyone, which is not the case. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong, micromanaging sucks. Don't want you to be a micromanager. That's the worst. But really take time. Like, here's how we do it at Chop Dog. Usually with a new hire, I like to sit and ask, like, be real with me. What, what makes you tick? What are you looking for? What's your ideal work environment? I like, we like to understand those kind of contexts. That's going to tell you everything. You know, you, you just have that conversation with someone and it builds that trust early on. Or nine out of 10, no one's ever asked him that question before where he or she's going to be like, wow, um, well, you know, this is to me the ideal work environment. And you can work and mold around that and help that person flourish. So like, for example, one of my, the most incredible designers on our team, her name is Child. She's unbelievable. One of the things I brought her on is she, she's a nomad. She travels the world. And her ideal work environment is where she doesn't have set hours, but can, can work at her own time, at her own pace, but she needs deadlines to hold herself accountable and needs someone to remind her of those deadlines consistently. We had a convo. She, she kicks butt for us. And we also put her in her dream work environment. And that dream work environment, actually, she has been open about. She does more work and better work and more, honestly, inspired work because we put her in that position, right? Versus an average company wouldn't even have that conversation to begin with. Right. Uh, it's more profitable for us as a company. It's more profitable for her. And it's more fulfilling for everyone. It's like, that's, you know, so it's, I think great leaders, they don't micromanage, but <laughs> they identify what makes each individual on their team tick to equal the greater lump sum. And I think that's what you got to figure out. Is, is that, do you think that is um, an easy thing for someone to embrace or do you think it takes, I mean, if that feels to me like a real mindset shift. It is a mindset shift, for sure. And it's, 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 it also, it's very, very difficult to scale. It's not impossible to scale, but it's difficult because it's, you hire 20 new people, you got to figure out 20 different ways people tick, right? So like, right. but the benefits there, when you have minimal turnover, when you have more people yeah. bought when you have more people willing to be patient, when you have more individuals that are committed, it's, it's that extra pain point is worth the opportunity and the growth and the ceiling out of it. It's what turns from good to great. You know, that's, that's the way I like to look at it. So it's, it is, it's a mindset shift. It's a patient shift. It's not something where you see results over. And I, I'm, I'm very open about this too. You don't mistake patience for a mistake. So like one of the things we, we talk about is we hire slow and fire fast, you know, that mentality. But yeah. part of that is sometimes you hire some natural talents and you go and understand, this can take six months before we see you firing all cylinders. But don't mistake the six months where someone is just not a right fit. Excuse me and as well, they just need more time. So you also have to trust your intuition between the mix of that as well. Oh, that's, that's a great point. Wow. Okay, so um, I love all this information, and I think I love it especially because it comes from, you know, your experience. Will you talk some about the book and how people can find it, um, you know, why you wrote it and how they can find it and, how, and um, some about Chop Dog and how they can find you? Definitely. So Entrepreneur's Framework, How Businesses Are Adopting New Economies, my first book. It's published and it came out on November 6th. So time of recording just 20 days ago, it's available on Amazon and select bookstores. The cool thing about Amazon, it's already an Amazon bestseller. Uh, It was the number one new release in business in the business category. Um, All the profits of the book, every single dollar actually is donated to Big Brothers Big Sisters in Philadelphia. So I'm not making a cent off of the book. And um, the book was basically wrote 
what I've shared with my clients now for years where in 2013, after the failure, I interviewed hundreds of what I called sustainable entrepreneurs, individuals who have been kicking butt for years, decades even. Because I want to understand like what makes an entrepreneur stick in this game forever? How do you not burn out? How, what are the right fundamentals? And as I mentioned, I identified eight principles of the framework. I'll just recap it. Self-awareness, empathy, leadership, short-term thinking, long-term thinking, economics, operations, and purpose. And basically what I do with the book is I try, I give people the crash course to get my clients, which is like, it's never been easier to build a business before. And you have to understand why that is. And also appreciate that. If you don't have the humility or understanding of like, now is more than ever, it's never been easier to be successful and easier to build something. You're going to fail by default, but also add that under respect of that means it's easier to fail than ever before because more people are doing it. And then I go into those eight principles and how to use each one as a weapon, as how to use each one to grow and how to use each one as basically dozens and hundreds of entrepreneurs I interviewed and you can find anyone makes up a great entrepreneur. And I even use the book as an example here, which is that a great entrepreneur does not mean you're pulling an area at a Huffington or a Mark Zuckerberg or a John Rockefeller. Like you don't need to grow multi-millions or billion dollar business to build a, uh, be successful. If you build a business right now to make six figures a year for yourself, employs dozens of people, gives them a house over their heads, like how it makes clients happy, grows your local community. is that not freaking incredible? And people don't think that way is success. So I'm also trying to understand like, what does success genuinely mean to you? Not what the media has fed you, not what you hear. What does it genuinely mean to you? What is that success point? And then you build your framework around that. And um, the book's a result of uh, back in 2013, when I said I had to rebuild Top Dog, how was I going to rebuild myself as an entrepreneur and basically my own belief system and it's wrote in exercises. So you can actually self analyze yourself, how you're doing as an entrepreneur, how you're growing, how you're becoming better, what you need to improve on. Um, there's exercises in each chapter of the book. So you can really take each of the principles and apply it to yourself and understand it. And then there's just real stories. So the book's partially like biography based, but partially it's a lot of these awesome stories um, in there too. And it's more just entrepreneurship because I believe entrepreneurship is just another form of art. So I reference things like Bruce Springsteen's in the book, Ben Franklin's in the book, Memento Memorial Stoicism from ancient Rome is in the book. Um, examples of local communities building, falling apart and growing is in the book. Understanding the economy is in the book. Like every aspect that to me is just, and is another example of how it makes entrepreneurship special. Um, so yeah, it's called Entrepreneur's Framework. It's available and physical copy and paperback, you can get it for the Kindle. If you have Kindle Unlimited, you can actually get it there. Um, the audio book will be on Audible in January, February. So plug for your sponsor there. Great. Uh, so yeah. actually tonight, I'll be at the recording studio working on that. Um, and then my company's called Chop Dog. Um, the best way to describe what we do is we build apps and software for companies around the world. Reality, we're like their outsourced CTO. So we are their chief technology partner, their technical team. We've actually built over 250 apps to date from Fortune 500, small businesses, nonprofits, Inc. 1000s, and brand new startups. And um, we, yeah, we, in essence, what we do is under one roof, we do everything. We have designers, developers, programmers, marketers, and we build, in my opinion, the best damn apps on the planet and help our clients make money, grow, scale, and really take them to a next level. And for a lot of our clients, we build their product that is what they use to build and serve their customer base. So um, yeah, and just this year, we are named um, Philadelphia's Entrepreneur of the Year by Clutch, ranked as the top 1% of what we do in the world. Um, we've got a couple of new awards. Forbes did a cover story on us recently about all the good we're doing for our awesome clients and how we're impacting them. Um, I think over clients this year alone, they've raised over $25 million in capital for the products we're using. Some of our clients handle billions a month just in, in straight up revenue through their apps that we built. So um, yeah, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world. We're like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for building. New <laughs> well, it sounds fabulous. Congratulations and congratulations on your first book. Uh, Thank let you. me know when it goes to Audible and, and we'll start including you in the um, sponsor break. Absolutely. Uh, Thanks so much for being here and sharing your insights. They're so valuable for entrepreneurs, uh, small business owners, people thinking about becoming entrepreneurs and even leaders in uh, companies. So uh, it's really awesome. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. 
Also like to thank the listeners and our sponsor that we've been talking about. If you would like to get a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip, 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip, 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. The world's best-known investor and Wall Street expert, Warren Buffett, once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo. For a podcast known to move the needle for investors, Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel.